So now that we understand what block ciphers are, let's look at a classic example called the data encryption standard. So just a quick reminder, block ciphers basically map n bits of input to n bits of output. And we talked about two canonical examples, triple DES and AES. In this segment, we're going to talk about DES, and we'll talk about triple DES actually in the next segment. And then I also mentioned before that block ciphers are often built by iteration. In particular, we're going to look at block ciphers that are built by a form of iteration where a key K is first expanded into a bunch of round keys, and then a round function is applied to the input message again and again and again. And essentially, after all these round functions are applied, we obtain the resulting ciphertext. Okay, and again, we're going to look at how DES, the data encryption standard, uses this format. I just want to be clear that, in fact, uh, to specify a block cipher of this type, um, one needs to specify the key expansion mechanism, and one needs to specify the round function. In the segment here, I'm going to focus on the round function, and I'm not going to talk much about key expansion, but I just wanted to mention that, in fact, key expansion is also a big part of describing how a block cipher works. Okay, so let's talk about the history of DES. Essentially, in the early 1970s, IBM realized that their customers are demanding some form of encryption. And so they formed a crypto group, and the head of that group uh, was Horst Feistel, who in the early 70s designed a cipher called Lucifer. Now, it's interesting. In fact, Lucifer had a number of variations, but one of the later variations, in fact, had a key length that was 128 bits and a block length that's also 128 bits. Okay? In 1973, the government realized that it's buying many commercial off-the-shelf computers, and so it wanted its suppliers to actually uh, have a good crypto algorithm that they could use in products sold to the government. So in 1973, the National Bureau of Standards, as it was called at the time, put out a request for proposals for a block cipher that's going to become a federal standard. And in fact, IBM submitted a variant of Lucifer. That variant actually went through some modification during the standardization process, and then finally, in 1976, the National Bureau of Standard adopted DES as a federal standard. And in fact, for DES, it's interesting that the key length was far reduced from Lucifer. It's only 56 bits, and the block length was also reduced uh, to 64 bits. And in fact, these decisions, especially the decision to reduce the, the key length, is kind of the Achilles heel of DES and was a source of many complaints over its life. In particular, already back in 1997, DES was broken by exhaustive search meaning that a machine was able to search through all 2 to the 56 possible keys to recover a particular challenge key. And in fact, we're going to talk about exhaustive search quite a bit. It's quite an interesting question, and there are various ways to defend against exhaustive search. And basically, this 1997 experiment kind of spelled the doom of DES. It meant that DES itself is no longer secure, and as a result, the National Institute of Standards, as it became known, uh, issued a request for proposals for a next generation block cipher standard. And in 2000, it standardized on a cipher called Rindell, which became the Advanced Encryption Standard, AES. And we'll talk about AES later on. But in this segment, I want to describe how DES works. Now, DES as a cipher, it's an amazingly successful cipher. It's been used in banking industry. In fact, there's a classic network called the Electronic Clearinghouse, which banks use to clear checks with one another. And DES is used for integrity in those transactions. It's also used in commerce. In fact, it was very popular up until recently as the main encryption mechanism for the web. Of course, now that's been replaced with AES and, uh, and other ciphers. Overall, it's a very successful cipher in terms of deployment. DES also has a very rich history of attacks, which we'll talk about in the next segment. OK, so now let's talk about the construction of DES. So the core idea behind DES is what's called a Feistel network due to Horace Feistel. And basically, it's a very clever idea for building a block cipher out of arbitrary functions f1 to fd. OK, so imagine we have these functions f1 to fd that happens to map n bits to n bits. Now, these are arbitrary functions. They don't have to be invertible or anything. What we want to do is build an invertible function out of those uh, d functions. And the way we'll do it is by building a new function we'll call it capital F that maps two n bits to two n bits. And the construction is described right here. So here we have our input. You notice there are two blocks of n bits. In other words, the input is actually two n bits. The R and L stand for right and left. Typically, people describe a Feistel network from top to bottom, in which case these n bits really would be right and left. But here it's more convenient for me to describe it horizontally. So if we follow the R input, you realize it basically gets copied into the L output without any change at all. Okay? 
However, the L input uh, is changed somewhat. Basically, what happens is the R input is fed into the function F1, and the resultant is XOR with L0, and that becomes the new R1 input. Okay, so this is called one round of a Feistel network, and it's done using the function F1. Now we do this again with another round of the Feistel network with the function F2, and we do it again and again and again, so we get to the last round, and we do it again with the function FD, and finally the output is RD, uh, LD. Okay, so if you like, we can write this in symbols, that basically LI is simply equal to RI minus 1, and RI, let's see, that's the more complicated one, Ri is equal, well, let's just follow the lines here. Ri is just equal to Fi applied to uh, Ri minus 1 XOR Li. Okay, so then, and this is basically I goes from uh, 1 to D. So this is the uh, equation that defines a Feistel network mapping a 2 n bit input to 2 n bit output. So here we have the, again, I just copied the picture of the Feistel network. And the amazing claim is that, in fact, it doesn't matter which functions you give me. For any functions f1 to fd that you give me, the resulting Feistel network function is, in fact, invertible. And the way we're going to prove that is basically we're going to construct an inverse. Because not only is it invertible, it's efficiently invertible. So let's see. So let's look at one round of a Feistel network. So here, this is the input, ri, li. And this is the output, ri plus 1, li plus 1. And now what I'm going to ask you is to invert this. So let's see. So suppose now the input that we're given is ri plus 1, li plus 1. And we want to compute ri, li. So we want to compute the round in the reverse direction. So let's see if we can do it. Well, let's look at ri. So ri is very easy. Basically, ri is just equal to li plus 1. So li plus 1 just becomes ri. But now let me ask you uh, to write the expression for Li in terms of Ri plus 1 and Li plus 1. So I hope everybody sees that basically Li plus 1 is fed into the function Fi plus 1. The result is XORed with Ri plus 1, and that gives the Li input. So this is the inverse of one round of a Feistel network. And if we draw this as a diagram, let's just write the picture for the inverse. So here you notice the input is Ri plus 1, Li plus 1, and the output is Ri, Li, right? So we're computing, we're inverting the round. So you notice that the inverse of a Feistel round looks pretty much the same as the Feistel round in the forward direction. It's literally, just for a technical reason, it's kind of the mirror image of one another, but it's basically uh, the same construct. And when we put these inverted rounds back together, we essentially get the inverse of the entire Feistel network. So you notice we start off with round number D, with the inverse of round number D, then we do the inverse of round number D minus 1, and so on and so forth, until we get to the inverse of the first round, and we get our final output, which is R0, L0. Right? This is the input, and we manage to invert, basically, RD, LD, and get R0, L0. And the interesting thing is that basically the inversion circuit looks pretty much the same as the encryption circuit, and the only difference is that the functions are applied in reverse order. Right? We started with FD and ended with F1, whereas when we were encrypting, we started with F1 and ended with FD. So for hardware designers, this is very attractive because basically if you want to save hardware, you realize that your encryption hardware is identical to your decryption hardware.